Okay, so my name is Fabien, and it's the first time I have uh, the pleasure to introduce someone in the hall. And this person is Jose Lutzenberger, who is uh, Lutz for his friends. And uh, it's, uh, he has a very interesting life. His family came to Brazil about a bit more than two centuries ago, 200 years ago, and they have settled there. And uh, he, he speaks uh, French and English as well as Portuguese and German. And it's very handy for me because I'm French, so I, 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 I connect with him in French. Um, he has worked as a, an agronomist in a, in a chemical company, a German company, for more than 10 years. And then he decided to leave because <coughs> it was not appropriate anymore, and he founded the Green Movement in Brazil in 1971. Uh, he was uh, later uh, awarded the Right Li Livelihood Prize for his work uh, in 1988. Uh, then in 1990, he was called to serve on the uh, government in Brazil as a uh, sec Secretary of Environment. And he did, he did uh, everything he could to, especially to protect the rainforest in Brazil. Uh, he had to leave, though, two years later, and, and he, he started a, a company and a foundation to promote uh, sustainable development in agriculture and industry. So here he is. Uh, please welcome with me Jose Lutzenberger. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm very happy to be here in Findhorn, a place that I know for over a decade, and a place for whose people I have a very profound sympathy. Uh, to begin with, I would like to stress, though, that I have a scientific, pragmatic, and also profoundly philosophical head. You will hear no esoterics from me, but I'm still a very emotional person. I consider myself a profoundly religious person, not in the traditional church way, but in terms of cosmic responsibility. And uh, within the scientific discipline, clean, coherent thinking, I'm a strong critic of modern technocratic, of the modern technocratic establishment, which calls itself scientific, but is really a prostitution of science. Well, the issue of peace being the main issue of this conference. I would like to stress that we have to look beyond, much beyond to what we're looking now. We have to look beyond us, the humans. Even if we achieved total peace on this planet, no more wars, no more social injustice, but if the rest continued as it is, it would still be a calamity. We find ourselves at war, the most devastating war ever, not in the history of mankind, which is maybe two million years old. In the history of life, in three and a half billion years of the history of life, something that unfortunately very few people learn to visualize. In the three and a half billion years of this fantastic history of life that makes our planet so different from the others, the other planets we know, this living planet, we are at war with creation. This fantastic process of organic evolution that, gave, that created us, of which we are only a small part, which is a, an incredibly beautiful symphonic process. Pity we don't have time to go into more detail. Am I talking too fast for the interpreter? Yes? OK, I'll try to, to OK. Well, I don't have to go into detail. Every educated, well-informed person knows that we now find ourselves in a situation where we are demolishing, obliterating what is still left of the life support systems of this planet. You all 
use the word Gaia, I don't know to what extent it means something to you, but we are destroying Gaia. We humans have become a parasite, a very serious disease on the body of Gaia. Those who come from Brazil, you only have to look out of the plane of the window on the plane to see how we're devastating the last remaining pieces of, of our savanna, the Cerrado, how we're now attacking the rainforest and so on. I don't want to dwell on all this, but it's the same all over the planet. In Africa, it's even worse than South America. Well, our present way of life, consumer society, is at war with the most precious thing on this planet, and that goes much beyond our species. We are only part of it. We are at war with creation. But then, why? Why? We think we're so intelligent. We're the only creatures in the animal kingdom that have the kind of intelligence that makes it possible for us to reason, to analyze all those things. But how, why do we behave in such a stupid way? Has it ever occurred to you to think, to question, to ask yourself why? Why has the Industrial Revolution happened in Christian Europe? Not in Buddhist China, <coughs> in Confucianist Japan, in Hinduist India. Why hasn't it happened among the Incas, the Mayas, the Aztecs, or among, we don't know how many thousands of tribal people? Why hasn't the Industrial Revolution happened in classical Greece? After all, they are the fathers of modern science. They are the first who learned to link, to think in total intellectual discipline, building beautiful, coherent, clean, unrefutable logic structures. Imagine if the Industrial Revolution had started 3,000 years ago among the Greeks, that is quite a possibility. Then we would either already have destroyed the last bacteria on this planet, there wouldn't be anything left, or, or we would now find ourselves in a situation of beautiful integration with a big, great symphony of life on this planet. But it hasn't happened 3,000 years ago. The uh, Industrial Revolution happened some 500 years ago in Christian Europe. Why? Why they are not up somewhere else? Because of our world view. We must go back, unfortunately we cannot now go into detail, we must go back to our remote Judeo-Christian past. In Genesis, something very bad happened, yes. In Genesis, we desacralized nature. We acquired an anthropocentric and then even ethnocentric ethic. Before that, when I say we now, I'm not referring to mankind as such, but to our line, to our cultural past. In Buddhism and all the other great religions, and in almost all, with very few exceptions, all the tribal uh, mythologies, ethics is holistic. It includes everything, not just us humans. We are seen as part of something bigger. But in Genesis, the old man with a white beard created us to his image and gave us paradise as kind of a property for us. Paradise has a meaning only to the extent that we can use it. And we, of course, we have to take care of it and so on, but it is there for us. Now, without going into more detail, and then we lost paradise and we found ourselves in the desert and the world became a bad place. Later in Christianity, in medieval Christianity, we saw the world as a valley of tears, a very bad place where we have to kind of submit to an exam 
with a lot of penitence and suffering and hard work, <coughs> so as to get up into that imaginary heaven somewhere behind or above the clouds or down into that enormous eternal furnace. But the world was a bad place. In all the other cultures, the world is a good place. In Buddhism, the world is a good place. In tribal uh, societies, in their mythologies, the world is a good place into which we have to integrate. For us medieval Christians, the world was a bad place. Unfortunately, unfortunately, at that time, we didn't have the power we have today. Otherwise, we would have destroyed, we would have destroyed the world then and there. So, while we still had this kind of mentality, seeing the world as a bad place, a place where you kind of had to pass an exam in order to get into a better world or a worse one, we got, we received through the Arabs, I wouldn't call it a present because we didn't know how to handle it, a Greek science. And we immediately, because of our worldview, prostituted it. Huh? For the Greeks, science was intellectual pleasure. It was like music. When they demonstrated the Euclidean theorems with a stick on the beach, well, they were enjoying the pleasure of, of reason. And so it didn't occur to them to tr change the world, at least not to the extent that we do it today. But as soon as medieval Europe, during the Renaissance, when we began to doubt the old values, was confronted with scientific discipline, we saw in it a means of dominating nature not a way of enjoying the beauty of the universe. The man who's considered the father of modern science in Europe, Francis Bacon, he's known for his statement, and this is often cited by ecologists as something ecological, but it is not. He's supposed to have said, if we want to dominate nature, we have to obey it. So I've heard ecologists say, you see, he was already thinking ecologically, we have to obey nature. But the emphasis of that sentence was in dominate, not in obeying. And there's another sentence by, <clears throat> another state, statement by Francis Bacon, we have to torture her. Really today, when you listen to our technocrats, they want to torture nature. Nature for them is there only to be tortured by us. Look at their attitude towards Amazonia. I will never forget, in one of our cabinet meetings, uh, we had the visit of a group of militaries, and they set up a big map of Amazonia on the wall. And on that map, there were many green spots. And looking at me, I was at the time Minister of the Environment, they said, oh, those ecologists, they don't really know what they're saying. Look at that. We're giving you all these natural reserves, ecological reserves, genetic banks. What do they want? So I said, if you are saying that these green spots on the map are a solution to our problems, then I cannot accept it. Because if I sign that this is the solution, then I'm signing that all that is white on this map and that's more than 80% will be destroyed by you. But they want to destroy those 80%. They cannot accept the idea that something as marvelous, as great, as incredibly multilateral and beautiful as the Amazon is not there to be by us demolished for something else. They will accept the idea, all right. We have to go for, we have to go for sustainable development without even knowing what sustainable is but they cannot leave things as they are. Nature is there to be by us, changed, demolished, or we must do something with it, but we cannot leave it as it is. And when they talk of integration, what they really mean is demolition, obliteration. 
Another time, I was asked to give a talk to the World Wildlife Fund that was in the White House in Washington. And uh, the meeting was by the World Wildlife Fund, and there were some 500 people in the room, and they were all, of course, interested in promoting natural reserves and ecological parks and so on. And I started my talk saying, you know, in my mind, the idea that we have to set up natural reserves, ecological parks and so on, is obscene. And I made a pause. But what kind of civilization, what kind of culture is it that has to set aside a few green spots on the map to protect them from our own destructiveness? Either we know how to live in the world, then we don't need parks, then everything will be park. Or when we're saying we're protecting that, we're also saying that we're going to destroy the rest. <clears throat> and I used the, the following metaphor. Suppose a, a thief, a robber, has penetrated into a big palace, and he has already destroyed dozens of rooms, and whenever he sees something valuable but that, that he doesn't like, he lets it crash on the ground and continues his destruction. And then comes the owner and says, my God, my God, what are you doing? What are you doing? And says, so, oh, don't worry, don't worry. I leave this little pantry there for you. This is our present attitude. This is the attitude of our present fanatic religion, consumer society. Consumer society is a fanatic religion. And the more so, the more we don't realize it is a religion. It is a fanatic religion. And it has already succeeded where other similar movements, similar only in, in intent, have not, fortunately. Christianity, Islam, and communism wanted to conquer the whole planet. Fortunately, neither of them succeeded. But modern industrial society has already conquered the whole planet. There may be some small groups of humans who still uh, don't, who are still kind of outside, but they're all contaminated already, and most of them want to participate. But this fanatic religion is in some ways different from the others. It has no profit. It was not created by one person, by one mind. It has no holy book. <clears throat> it has no unif unified catechism. Its rules change all the time. And its ideology is never expressed explicitly. But it's in everything that we say and everything that we do. It's always implicit. When you listen to our politicians, to our public administrators, <clears throat> when you read our papers and so on, <clears throat> it's always there, but it's implicit. Very rarely do they state their dogmas explicitly. <clears throat> and this uh, religion the, has <clears throat> as its most important priests, the guys who call themselves as economists. I'm not talking of those economists who study uh, human affairs in a scientific, from a scientific perspective, uh, such as, let's say, Herman Daly, who is a man who looks at the economy from an ecological point of view, and who realizes that economics is only a chapter in ecology, because ecology deals with the, with the business of life, then when we deal with the business of humans, it's part of ecology, because we are part of the living process on this planet. Well, but the economists who today orient the decisions of our politicians, and there's almost no difference between people such as Pinochet or Fidel Castro or Margaret Thatcher or Blair or now Schroeder and Kohl and so on. They all believe in the same religion. They all accept the same basic tenets of that religion. And they, these people, the economists, have uh, fixed in the minds of most of our powerful 
a, a very absurd world view. They see a unidirectional flow from one infinite to another. Here they postulate infinite resources. Even though they know and they have to realize that petroleum will, will be gone eventually and so on, they say, but there will always be substitutions. If we have no more petroleum tomorrow, we still have coal for another 500 years, and we have nuclear fission and then nuclear fusion, and eventually our modern technology will show us how to use the forces of matter and antimatter. So this is infinite in their mind. We have no problem with resources. And here they postulate an infinitely deep hole where we can throw all our garbage and residues and shit and whatever. Yeah. Well, if you believe in a unidirectional flow between two infinites, then there is nothing wrong with this flow getting thicker and thicker, infinitely. If this is infinite and that is infinite, no problem, that flow getting thicker and thicker and thicker. Hence, their main <coughs> basic postulate. The postulate that an economy is only healthy when it grows. And it has to keep growing. If last year our economy grew 7%, and this year it grew only 3 then we are already in a profound crisis. And uh, <coughs> growth has to be exponential. If we grow 3% or 7% this year, it's on top of the 107% of last year. So if now the economy is 500% of what it was 40 years ago, the 7% growth is on the 500, not on the 100. But, but you know that this is impossible. Look at a human being. When we are born, in the first three months, we double our weight. In the second three months, we don't double it anymore. And then less and less and less. And when we reach the age of 20, we stop growing. And when we get older, we even <laughs> ungrow. I'm now a meter 74. When I was young, I was a meter 78. And then we die. So how can they postulate something that grows eternally? Take one of those modern calculating machines that has the exponential uh, function and work out a doubling. Suppose, I'm now 72 years old, suppose I had continued to double my weight from birth until today. There would have been four times 72 doublings. Work that out. I would be bigger than the whole known universe today. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's, so it is really amazing how people who consider themselves and who are considered intelligent, how they can adhere to this kind of stupid dogma, that an economy has to grow all the time. That is maybe because they see this flow activated by a closed circle, the circle of money. Since money is an abstraction, and there's no limit to how much money we can create, they think that this is possible forever. But nature is not like that. All the living systems are based on eternal recycling. It is a closed circle. The corpses, the residues, the excrements of the ones are always the raw materials of the others. If it wasn't like that, we wouldn't be sitting here today after three and a half billion years of evolution. If life had acted on that principle, it would have disappeared during the first years of evolution, three and a half billion years ago. And this planet would be as barren again as Venus or Mars or Jupiter and all the others. And this closed circle of resources in life of the living systems is activated by an open flow, yes, an open flow of solar energy. Solar energy is an open flow, but it is, to all practical purposes, infinite, infinite in time. Our sun will continue 
shining for another four and a half or maybe five billion years. So it is infinite in time, but not in space. The sun gives us, at the distance we find ourselves from it, 150 million kilometers, the sun gives us something like 1,400 watt per square meter. By the time it reaches the ground, it's about 900, because the difference goes into climate and so on. But it is that much per square meter. And it strikes me that technocracy doesn't like solar energy for two reasons. And that's why they don't make the necessary research so we could have a really sustainable economy. Solar energy can only be used effectively if we use it in a decentralized way. Everybody uses, every roof could capture its own solar energy. That goes against the main aim of technocracy that wants concentration. When they think of solar energy, they want, they think of big solar farms in the Sahara producing hydrogen and pumping that hydrogen through pipelines to Europe or in cryogenic, at cryogenic temperatures, in tankers, all over the world, and so on. They don't like decentralization. And there's one more aspect that I think for the technocrat is even more important. You see, here, these resources, petroleum, metals, and so on, they can steal from future generations. We can use today the petroleum that belongs to people who haven't been born yet. But here we can use or leave. We cannot steal the Soviet energy and the solar energy of our children of future generations. You can see that in the heads of technocracy, solar energy is subversive. Like so many of the right things that we should be doing in their heads are subversive. Well, let's go back to this uh, basic postulate of modern economic thinking, the dogma uh, that an economy is only healthy when it keeps growing. Now, how do they measure that growth? They measure growth with a unit of measurement they call gross national product. In Portuguese, produto nacional bruto, or gross internal product, also gross social product. But what is the GNP? I'm a, an entrepreneur, a small businessman. In my business, like everybody else who's in business, we make a very simple accounting. We add up all the income here, and we deduct all our costs here, and then we make write-off on our properties. If I buy a tractor today at $100,000, by the end of 12 months, it will be worth, in my accounting, something like $93,000. So we add up all the income, deduct all the expenses, and make write-off on our properties, buildings, machines, and so on. You know what the gross national product is? A unit used by our politicians, by our politicians, communist or capitalist or whatever. The gross national product is the sum of everything, of all money flow in the economy. Suppose I'm the owner of a bar, and I buy the barrel of beer for price X. And uh, selling beer, I make 2X. And then I have expenses with rent, and, and, and electricity, and water, and so on, plus the waiters. Suppose I were to add up x plus 2x plus all the other costs. I would have a very beautiful sum, wouldn't I? But I might as well buy the beer for 2x and sell it for 1. I'd have the same balance. Yes. It sounds incredible, doesn't it? But it is true. Our governments make this kind of accounting. So a plane crash 
Suppose the plane who brought me over the Atlantic now, a 747 that is worth, I think, something like $200 million. If that plane had crashed, the Brazilian economy would have grown $200 million first when Varek receives the money from the insurance. Then it would have grown another $200 million when Varek bought a new plane. And all the expenses of salvaging the pieces of the crashed plane and, and, uh, <coughs> and medicine and, and the, the, what do you call them, those people who inter us and so on, all those costs would have, the undertaker, all those costs would have added to our national growth, national product. So the more planes crash, the better for the economy in that worldview. Yeah? If our pollution had reached the point where everybody is seriously sick, so we have to build dozens of new hospitals and, and schools of medicine and so on and so on and so on, the economy, in the view of these economists, would be a healthier economy because our gross national product would be growing. So they don't distinguish what that money flow makes. Because they go, they base their thinking on the idea that every time money flows from one hand to another, somebody has an income, all right. But they don't ask what that income did and what it was for. So the gross national product is an absurd measure when it comes to comparing progress. It is very interesting for the banker, because the banker profits every time, no matter what direction the money goes. So from the point of view of the banker, of the technocrat, the gross national product is a beautiful measurement. But from the point of view of human happiness, of human satisfaction, of human survival, it is a total stupidity. Now, since we have so many Brazilians here, uh, let's make a very simple consideration. When we compare the Brazilian gross national product, per capita. Now it's something like, uh, I think it's three and a thousand, three and a half thousand dollars, three thousand five hundred dollars. With the Swedish or Norwegian gross national product, they are close to twenty-eight thousand. So our politicians and economists say, my God, the Swedes, the Norwegians are eight times more progressive than we are. How poor buggers we are. We have three five and they have twenty-eight. But when you look at the, at the Norwegian and the Swedish gross national product, you will see that probably more than a third, or maybe a half of that sum, goes into things that we Brazilians don't even need. They have a climate that makes it necessary for them to spend an awful lot of money on warm clothing, on heating, in the bus and in the home, and everywhere in the stadium on icebreakers and ice plows and snow plows and so on. All things that we Brazilians don't need. So to that extent, are we $8,000 poorer than they? No, we're $8,000 richer than them. We have for free what they have to buy. <laughs> <laughs> Shows you the absurdity of this kind of measurement. Then there's another aspect. Since uh, economists, uh, this kind of economist sees, uh, they operate on an abstract, transcendental level where they handle only money. All those aspects and factors of human life that are really important, such as happiness, friendship, love, harmony, beauty, and also the opposite, suffering, pain, destruction, all these aspects, the really important aspects of human life, do not enter economic thinking. Let me give you a true metaphor. When I think of my mother, of what my mother did for us children, for me and my two sisters when we were children, of how she gave us a sentiment of belonging, of coziness, of happiness, how she helped us in schoolwork, how she put her hands into the black soil in our garden and taught me to love the earth, 
seen all these things. I would certainly be a completely different person had I not had that mother. But my mother never received one penny for this kind of work. So this kind of activity doesn't exist in modern economic thinking. So some of the most important work is inexistent in the heads of the economists. Now, if my mother had had a job in a factory making the palm to burn Vietnamese children alive, and if she had gotten $10,000 a month for that, she would have contributed to the gross national product but $10,000. Isn't it incredible? The more you think of it, the more you wonder how come people who consider themselves as intelligent and reasonable can adhere to this kind of thinking. Let's look at another aspect. So the gross national product tells us nothing concerning human happiness, which, after all, is the most important aim of the economy, isn't it? We want to be happy. We want to be, live in a beautiful world. It also tells us nothing about social justice. Let's go back to Brazil. The boy of Fria, the day laborer on the big sugarcane plantations, who makes only some $500 a month, a year, and has to feed 13 people with that little money, eating lizards and insects and worms and so on. And his boss, the sugar baron, who makes millions a year, most of it illegal or, or absurd subsidy. Well, the $3,500 of the Brazilian gross national product per, per year, per head, is an average between the guy who makes $500 a year and the other one who makes $5 million. So what does it tell us about human justice? Nothing. It tells us nothing. Also, it tells us nothing about true costs. Look, we are now in Brazil demolishing whole mountains, flooding thousands of square kilometers of pristine forests in order to export aluminum and iron ore. In the accounts of our government, they add up only the foreign currency we earn by exporting this aluminum and iron and other things. But they, in no place in their accounts do they discount the hole that is now left in the mountain. The 100,000 square kilometers of forest that were cleared, that were devastated along the railway from Saint Louis de Marignan down to Carajas and so on. It is as if I went to my bank and took money from my account, spent that money in orgies or whatever, and then considered myself richer. But I'm poorer because now there's less money in my account. National accounts of all the countries in the world, and I know no exception, do not see that hole in their accounts. They see only the income and the stuff they spend, but they do not account for, that we, for, what, we lose, for what we lost. The U.S. has already pumped out of its ground more than 90% of its oil. And now they want to pump out the last remaining 4 or 5% as fast as possible. And they consider themselves richer with every barrel of oil they pump out. But they're poorer. They're much poorer today than they were 50 years ago. And we in Brazil are infinitely poorer today than we were 50 years ago when all our nature was still intact. Look what we're doing. Well, I mentioned it already. So this kind of... This kind of thinking of measurement is totally absurd. It doesn't see reality. They see only the flow of money. Now let's see another, the second dogma that has now become very strong. After, my time is almost running out, after the collapse of the uh, repressive systems regimes in the East, it has become the main dogma today that the forces of the market will solve all our problems. They think that communism collapsed only because it didn't uh, allow the market to work freely. Well, it is true that the forces of the market are a cybernetic 
scheme of finding equilibrium, finding a balance between opposite forces. Uh, everybody knows that things don't have a true price. Value is subjective. If I have a ball of gold and I go with it to a, a jeweler, it may be worth a lot of money. But if I find myself <coughs> starving or dying of thirst in the desert, I may give that ball of gold for one cup of water. So the market really is a mechanism that tries to find equilibria between opposing forces. And that is a good thing, yes. But the market will only give us socially acceptable and ecologically good results when all forces are present and when it is not manipulated. Let's look at manipulation first. All our markets today are highly manipulated. Pity I don't have time to go into more detail. But let me give you another metaphor. <coughs> Suppose we're at an auction <coughs> and a very precious historical object is being presented. Let's say a Chinese vase, a thousand years old, something very precious. And, and in the audience, there are people who know the preciousness of that object, let's say, directors of important museums who want to buy it. But the guy who offers it is a thief. And he wants to get out as fast as he can. If those professors or directors of the museums know it and agree, they will buy it for $500. Now, isn't that the situation of the raw materials, of the resources of the third world? Who is it that is selling the logs of Amazonia? Who is it that is selling our raw materials? It's our bandits, not the Brazilian people. It's our bandits who are selling our resources. So we, wherever you look in modern industrial society, you see manipulated markets. One of the worst manipulated markets is the common market agricultural policy. Pity we can't go into detail, but in Rio Grande do Sul, we have totally destroyed one of the great forests of the planet, the subtropical rainforest in the, in the Uruguay Valley, to plant soybean. Soybean, not to feed hungry Brazilians, of which we have too many, but to feed fat cows in the common market. That is possible only because of total manipulation. So our markets are totally manipulated. Then, our <coughs> markets are almost always incomplete. I mentioned that poor day laborer on the sugarcane plantations in the Northeast. I might mention the poor bugger who dies at night <coughs> on the pavement in Bombay and whose, in India and whose body, whose corpse is removed by the garbage truck in the morning, his total wealth was a dirty piece of linen, <coughs> loincloth, and a, a, an old turban. This guy has tremendous necessities, but he has no demand, he has no money. The market doesn't see him. The market only sees those who have money. It sees demand. It doesn't see necessity. Yeah? So the market instead, the way it operates today, unless we manage to introduce ombudsmen defending the poor and demanipulating the market and so on and so on, the way it works today, the way it operates today, the market concentrates power to the most indecent and takes away from the poor, from the decent. It does exactly the opposite of what it should have been doing. Yeah. <clears throat> so the market is mostly manipulated. It's blind for the poor. And it is blind, and this is even worse, for future generations. 
Future generations have no word, have no power in our markets today. If the people who are going to be born in Brazil 100 years from now, if they could have a word in today's markets, my God, they wouldn't let us do 1% of what we're doing. And even the children already born who have no power, if they knew what was happening and had power in our markets, my God, the world would be different. So the market is manipulated, is blind to poverty, is blinder still to future generations. And there's one more aspect, even worse. Because if we let this blindness continue, there won't be any future generations. The market is blind for creation. When that powerful guy in Brazil clears 10,000 hectares of rainforest, of pristine, intact rainforest, kills the Indians living in there, and so on and so on. For him, that fantastic ecosystem has a negative value. He spends money to destroy it. But for all the creatures in there, and for the living planet, it has an infinite value. So you see, either we learn to demanipulate the market. The, the Scandinavians have a very interesting figure there, the ombudsman, who in the market acts for those who are not present. Perhaps we could find some way of doing that. Well, my time is almost over now. Well, the red light is not on yet. But so what can we do? Well, we can do an awful lot. But first, we must realize that it is not enough to work for our personal peace of mind. That is good, that's very important, but it is not enough. If we think that, my, that achieving my personal peace of mind, that's all I have to do, then I will sleep in peace and let the world go to parts. Yeah. <clears throat> we have to, first of all, question the predominant economic thinking. Yeah? We must simply not accept this economic thinking as it is today, from which comes all the lifestyle we have today with that incredible squandering of resources and so on. Perhaps we could, as a first step, without even talking of a new holistic ethics and without even talking of ecology, if we could get our governments, our public administrators, to accept the idea that we need for our countries, for our nations, a kind of balance of the same type that I make in my business. Now, when we make money exporting aluminum, all right, we made that money, but now we deduct the hole that was left in the mountain. We deduct the genocide of the Indian. We deduct the marginalization, the uprooting of the caboclo, and so on and so on and so on. Then, if we could get our governments to make a true honest balance of our national wealth, then they could cheat nobody into believing that we're getting richer. Everybody would realize that every day we are poorer, not richer. Because we're demolishing this wonderful world of which we're only part. So maybe if we could only put this into the hands of our politicians, that in our parliaments, the idea was discussed that we need a new kind of accounting for the country. And it need not be anything fundamentally new. If only for the country we accepted the kind of balance that every businessman makes in his business, no matter how small, then nobody would believe in this kind of progress anymore. And then, of course, we have to preach what you have been preaching all the time, a holistic ethic. We must go back to an ethic that includes all of creation, not just our species. Now, this would be the subject of another talk, but I do not want to overextend my time. But I would like to draw my attention, st my attention still to one more aspect, to one of the great disasters of modern times. Our present civilization, our present culture, this fanatic religion I just mentioned, consumer society, the latest uh, outgrowth of global industrialism uh, contains a very nefarious 
paradox. Modern industrial society is based 100% on ever more sophisticated technology. Technology that, in its turn, derives from ever more profound science. But almost the totality of people that live this kind of civilization, and even and especially those who consider themselves as cultured, are total illiterates in technology and science. And they don't, they don't think that's important. That is awfully important. That is awfully dangerous. <clears throat> if you're ignorant, if your scientific horizon is very small, very narrow, you cannot even understand what is happening. You will not see where the power structures are and how they operate. You will not be able to distinguish between plow and gallows. And this is our situation today. The few people who know are specialists, very narrow specialists. And the majority are totally illiterate in science and technology, which is the most important characteristic of our present culture. <laughs> so I will finish with an appeal, at least to the young. Do whatever you can to broaden your scientific, technical, and philosophic ethical horizon. And then go out, preach, a truly holistic ethic that includes all of creation and question the types of power structures we have today, technocracy. Thank you very much. Thank you.